Oh, this will be fun. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Brett Luter Show. This is episode 69. I'm super excited. I call it From Conception to Birth Certificate. There is this uh, section in human spirituality from the conception, from when sperm hits the egg, to when you're birthed through the water canal, and you're issued the warehouse receipt known as the birth certificate, that is hugely understudied, underreported. I have a man with me uh, by the name of Curtis Kallenbach, who specializes in that little section, among other things. He's also the author of First in Time, a Pacific Transcription. We're going to ask him about that. The new book's called Expert Witness. We're going to ask him about that. He's also the host of the podcast, A New Word Order. And if I didn't know that Curtis came up with that name, I would say that was a that's a Jordan Maxwell title all the way. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me and welcome to the show, Curtis Collenbach. Curtis, welcome. What's up? Fun, man. This will be fun. That this is going to be awesome. I can already feel your energy coming through. I wish I could see you. How come we can't see you? <laughs> Listen, you know what? I I've been fighting tooth and nail to keep my biology out of the public for the better part of 15 years. And um, so I don't offer it up freely. Nobody, okay. nobody gets a piece of me for free. Um, in fact, my knowledge of, of what's been happening with the birth certificate and things like that, um, the evidence is overwhelming that, that, that by even claiming a birthday, we're allowing a piece of our biology to, to become part of the public rather than me walk outside my front door and walk down the street in the public uh, the evidence is that by claiming a birth certificate of character or by allowing your image and all that stuff to go um, unclaimed, you become part of the public, thus losing, losing your privacy. So I, it's, it's funny because I used to actually do these things with photos or, or, or live you know, images and things like that. But then I just realized I can't do it. No offense to anybody that does, but I, I just I'm, I'm done pretending that i i don't know i'm done pretending i don't know how's that I, I can actually get that i'm uh i'm maybe not as farther along that path as you but i am tired of having to give my social security number to get employment and and what that means um and i i had the great honor and privilege to study with jordan maxwell and he started to teach me about the words and symbols and terms which i know you're big on and he started what he called it was the magic of society and that magic, that ritual that we call society uh, is driven by our own consent. If we didn't participate in it, it couldn't happen. So I actually get what you're saying. Although I haven't gone that far yet, I understand why you would do that. So um, yeah. So social security number, uh, just really quickly, I learned was a way for them to suck out your life force in the in the way of Federal Reserve notes, which is a represent symbolic representation of your of your spiritual energy, you put you know you work hard every week, and you get rewarded for that. The symbol of that energy, the the product of that energy, are your Federal Reserve notes, and then they siphon them off in in ever increasing taxes, fines, and fees, and uh, that's part of how they siphon off your life energy within that ritual, the magic of society. So when did you first meet Jordan? Well, I was pretty far along. I mean, when I started back in 2008 or nine or whatever it was, okay. I started with, with, you know, the, the, the William Coopers and the Jordan Maxwell's and the guys were amazing to me. I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, understand that my, my world, I didn't even know this other stuff existed. And, 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 and that's what I try to tell people, even where I'm at today. I mean, with the knowledge I have today, with I, I mean, and I'm going to say it out loud. I'm, I'm light years ahead of everybody. There's nobody even close to what I'm talking about at this point. Even even Jordan said, "Dude, you're 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 far beyond anything I I ever taught." But here's the thing: is I couldn't. I'm just going to. I couldn't convince myself what I know today. If I went back in time, twenty years, so Kurt visits Kurt. I couldn't convince Kurt that this today's Kurt is, is, is correct. That, uh, that I'm right. right. I would call myself, get out of my face, asshole, you know, that type of thing, right. because I would, I wouldn't believe what I was saying. And yet I'm the same guy. 
and and so it's an impossible it's an impossible task to to get to the point where you finally know what's actually happening. And I'm going to do something before we get too far along. Is what was the title? What did you call the title of this 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 show? From conception to birth certificate. <laughs> okay, I, right off the bat, I have to I, I, I have to correct you. <laughs> okay, please do. That's fine. It happens all the um, time. Because conception. Do I sound? Am, am I too loud? Do I get too loud? Am no, I, you sound okay? great. Okay, conception is not creation. Creation when dad's. 23 chromosome sperm fertilizes mom's 23 chromosome ovum. That's called fertilization. And fertilization is the act of creation itself. That's when a brand new single celled entity called zygote is actually produced or created. So fertilization is the beginning of life. Okay. Then somewhere, somewhere around seven to 10 days later, after you've floated, you've been floating in space in the, in the waters of mother for a while, you, you land, you land into the uterine wall that's called implantation but implantation is actually the definition of conception so conception happens about seven days after creation okay so when you use the word conception you're falling into the legal system because the legal system is based upon conception or implantation versus creation which happens about seven days earlier and that there's a big difference there okay. because creation is where you and god I and my father are one. You and God are, you exist simultaneously. Darwin meets God is what I call it. And, 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 and in implantation is where you actually come from the heavens, i.e. floating in the waters of mother, the heavens, and you land on the earthly, the mother earth, which is the uterine wall. That's heaven and earth. That's when you come out of the heavens and land into earth or the uterine wall. That's called conception or implantation and believe it or not they don't even call it pregnancy until you land into the uterine wall so life exists about seven days even before pregnancy how's that well i think that's, that's pretty amazing cool. yeah that's pretty yeah cool. yeah so, so i'll change the before i post this i'll change it from conception to fertilization will that work oh yeah you absolutely have to do that because um conception is is a it, it's a mistake and by the way conception mm. leads to birthday whereas fertilization is the beginning of life and that's where your that's where your rights begin your rights begin at fertilization that's where innocence exists whereas um the product of conception is the birth certificated afterbirth there's a huge difference between creation and life and and the human remains left behind after baby comes out of mom's womb and so uh, i i'm i rail against it there's a there's an article out of uh what was it what was the name of the magazine anyway it was called the science about when life begins no the science about when life begins makes pro-choicers look terrible it's called fertilization and the me the name of the magazine was called the federalist believe it or not the federalist.com so you can actually go to this article the science about the science about when life begins makes pro choicers look terrible at the federal at the federalist.com and read it for yourself because back in the early 70s they actually kind of changed the definition of conception to mean well, something different and and that's important in the legal in the legal realm yeah uh, you know, you, you're psychic because that's where I was going to go with this. Is I was going to ask you how this affects abortion. Because, you know, on the one hand, it seems logical. Well, everyone has a right to do what they want with their body. But on the other hand, it's it's a, the debate is about when does life start? And so supposedly before life starts, it's OK to have an abortion. But <clears throat> nothing makes a pro-abortion, especially woman, right to life or, or uh, right to choice lady more angry i found than when you say well where do you draw that line and they just seem to just explode on me all the time so so you're you're taking that line and you're not just taking it to a, a zygote you're taking it even further and i'm just saying i'm just saying that nature doesn't give you the option life begins at fertilization there is no there is no debate every embryologist on planet earth knows when life begins but but what happens is if pregnancy doesn't begin until implantation, 
Genesis 2 2 says, you know, on the seventh day, God rests. Yeah, that's you planting into the wall of the uterus. So for the first seven days of your existence, roughly, you're not bound, you're not attached to mom yet. And 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 that, but life exists. So imagine if there's a spontaneous abortion where you don't implant, then you just get washed out, even though life existed. If you don't plant into the uterine wall, you get washed out through menses. And and even though you existed, even though life existed, that would be a spontaneous abortion. What's really weird, though, is that this little space of time between creation and pregnancy allows for all these legalities to occur. By the way, in the United States, I got to be clear about this, too. Please. It's funny because in, in the United States... The United States National Institutes of Health says that pre-implantation is correct, is tra traditionally is correct, meaning that life begins at fertilization. They're saying life begins at fertilization, pre-implantation. So the United States agrees that life begins at fertilization, but it doesn't matter whether it agrees or not because nature decides what's true. So nature says life begins at fertilization. And the United States agrees with that. Well, the Roman Catholic Church says, no, conception is life. So now there's not, here's where the argument comes in. This is where people go, well, uh, it's a woman's right to choose. Yeah, I agree. It's none of my business, actually. I'll be honest with you. It's none of my business. But it doesn't mean life doesn't begin at fertilization. Mm -hmm. So you can argue your your morality all day long. But you can't stop the truth. The truth is life begins at fertilization. Call it what you want if you end it. You can call it abortion if you want. By the way, if you clamp and cut the umbilical cord, the material left behind is actually aborted fetal material. So imagine all the afterbirths considered abortion too. It's, it's, if they clamp and cut the umbilical cord, that's aborted fetal material. So everything's abortion. There's all the left behind human remains at the hospital called afterbirth is actually aborted fetal material. And by the way, I should say this right off the bat. It's the aborted fetal material that gets the birth certificate, not the baby. So wait a minute here, Kurt. Are you telling me that the aborted fetal material is the actual birth certificated person? Yep. Not the baby. Baby doesn't get any paper. That would be that would be documentation of slavery. The aborted material gets the birth certificate. Okay. Can can you go a little deeper into that? Because I find yeah, because yes, because because that material left behind is considered the deposit in in the trust in in God we trust. Uh -huh. So imagine this aborted fetal material that has your biology becomes the surety to every action in the banking system around the world. They're using the aborted fetal material as the surety, which then joins you to every action in those lower courts. It's the initial, not the deposit. baby. No, it's the initial deposit. Interesting. interesting. <laughs> I, I get to at least look at your face and, and your response to these things, man. It's 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 amazing when people start to the, the lights turn on, you know, and I've, I've studied law for for over 20 years now and a wide variety of gurus. I could drop a bunch of names um, and, and Jordan's where it started for me back in the early 2000s. I saw him at a UFO expo of all places. Love and, the man. <laughs> and, uh, isn't he, he was great, man. He was just, he was so awesome. But he blew my mind open. And uh, here you are 20 plus years later, blowing it open again. Even knowing the stuff that I know already, I'm still getting my mind blown. So, so okay. So do you have anything else to say about fertilization to birth certificate before we move to the birth certificate? Um, Anything else we should know? I Yeah. Yeah. The, the entire system is predicated upon that the cutting or the separation of you from your origin. I, I'm going to try to make it really simple. Okay, that makes sense. Um, imagine a, a piece of string, and and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say that every inch of, of the piece of string equals one month. One month. So for me, I have. Um, a piece of string that stretches nine months in the womb, that's nine inches. And then I have a piece of string that stretches from September 19th, 1960 at 350 AM, which is another 63 years, which would be another 63 years times, you know, 12 inches. So let's say you have 63 feet. Remember each year is 12 inches, 12 months. So you got 63 feet of string plus nine inches from in the womb, the time in the womb. So 
the reason this is important is because a lifetime begins at fertilization. So the first nine inches of that string is in the womb. The next 63 plus years or 63 feet of the string is outside the womb. But the life itself is singular, which means it's one piece of string. It's one unbroken, uncut piece of string. What they do is they cut the first nine inches off and they say that that's the unborn um, version of you. And then the, everything outside the womb is the born version of you. They create this false duality. The unborn gets a birth certificate. The born becomes an indigenous person on the land with no rights. The born. In other words, the baby goes home with mom and dad, but the baby doesn't have any name because the name falls back there with the birth certificated character. And then all of us, because we we follow the lemming in front of us, we all adopt the birth certificated character as if it was our own name when in fact it's not our property at all it's the state's property they created right. the name so so now we adopt this character which we don't own and and it doesn't even reflect our own biology because the character that is left behind isn't just my biology it's part mom too sure so the the, the placenta is a feto maternal organ so what they have on deposit is actually Madonna and child, mother and child, Jesus and Mary, veto maternal, my biology, the baby, the infant, plus mom. And that is the birth certificated person. Now, again, if I claim the birth certificated person, if I if I do, then I'm also claiming not just my biology, I'm claiming somebody else's. And then th that's where all the crimes begin. Because if I claim the excess, my mom's biology, it's a trespass. But remember what the birth certificate also evidences. It evidences a piece of me that I forgot. So it also evidences a deficiency in my own estate. So think about that. If I want to try to become whole and I go, oh, I got to include the birth certificated biology. Okay, so I, I try to add that by claiming the birthday. But, I, but by adding that, yeah, I get my biology, but I also get mom's. Now I'm overstepping. That becomes a surplus. It actually becomes what they call an indulgence. So again, if, if you know anything about the Roman Catholic Church and the, and the selling of indulgences over the decades, that extra, that maternal biology over and above my own becomes an indulgence. So that's, again, I'm, 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 I call it a data dump. You know, most people don't even know what I'm saying half the time, <laughs> but, but all you have to do is go to new word order and, 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 and look up, you know, or listen to some of my stuff. Right. Um, but this is so fun, Brett. I mean, yes. at this point, at this point, let me do one last thing before sure. I forget, because in my, the, the last call I did, which was just, oh, well, today's Friday. So I guess it was yesterday morning. I brought up the idea of the birthday. So the birthday is not yours. No living being has a birthday. So, I mean, once you understand why you don't have a birth or a birthday, it, may, it all makes sense because creation only happens one time. That's called fertilization. And from fertilization to last breath, it's one life unbroken. There is no duality. It's just one. It's one whole life. So here's what's really weird about the birthday. And I, what I did is I, I, every morning I wake up with something new on my, in, on my mind because it's so obvious to me at this point. Yesterday, I woke up and I went, oh, my God, I just realized that if, if somebody asks me a question, if somebody asks me a question, Kurt, when's your birthday? That question, by them asking me the question, and this is where people, the legality comes in. This is where everything changes when you, when you actually know the truth all the way down, all the way back, all the way back to the beginning. So Brett says to me, Kurt, when's your birthday, man? Because we're out drinking beers and, and you want to know. And I go, well, that question is a presumption, Brett. I mean, you're presuming I have one. Okay. And you go, well, everyone has one. So when is your birthday? Now it becomes a claim, your claim that I have a birthday. I'm not claiming a birthday. You, you're telling me I have one. So it's a claim on your end. And this is where the burden of proof falls on your shoulders, not mine. So when you say, hey, Kurt, when's your birthday? And I go, hey, man, wait a minute here. That's a presumption that I have one. Well, everybody has a birthday. That's a claim. Now you've made a claim. And now you're asking me 
about your claim and the fact that you made the claim, not me, the burden of proof is on your shoulders to prove right. I have a birthday. That's right. And now remember, the entire system is predicated upon the birthday. Without a birthday, no court action occurs. There is no way for them to bring you into a court action without the birth certificated character. So the fact that nobody knows that the burden of proof is on the asker, it's on the speaker. When somebody asks you, when's your birthday? That's a presumption. It, in, in other words, if, if you ask me and I say, well, that you're presuming I have one. Well, everybody has one, Kurt. So when is your birthday? Now you're making a claim that everyone has a birthday. And that claim forces you to produce the evidence that I have a birthday. Burden of proof. Every single case in the world could be thrown out if you actually understood what I just said, because their entire system is predicated upon birth certificate persons. As sureties, the warrant, the warranties, the warrantors, if, if they don't have a birth certificate person to act as the trustee for their, their trust property, the case is gone. They have to throw it out. So look at the simplicity of what I just said. You ask me if I have a birthday, which is a presumption. So I ask you, say, man, you're presuming I have one. Kurt, everybody has a birthday. So when's your birthday? That's a claim. Now you just made a claim that everybody has a birthday and you're forcing that claim upon me, which now forces you to, to, to be, you're the one that has the burden of proof. Now imagine that. Imagine every court now having to prove that the people in front of them have birthdays. You know what they would have to do? They would have to show that for the last at least since 1933 with FDR, they would have to throw out every single case that has ever happened based upon that birth certificated character since 1933 because nobody has a birthday. That's the afterbirth. That's well, the left behind human remains. So this is why they get you to just say that you do. But look at how we, you don't, you don't even have to get yourself forward. in trouble. Yeah, but you don't have to get in trouble. You just say, listen, that's a presumption, but better yet, it's even a claim. You're claiming that I have a birthday. So the burden of proof is on you to prove that I have a birthday. And yeah. you know what? No court's ever going to do that. The trust is gone. The moment you do that, the, the, the presumed trust is gone. That's what everybody's been trying to do is get rid of this, this trust that forces us into the, to become the res of that trust property or join us to this action, this court action. But you know what? There's no joinder. There's no joinder at all. If there's no birthday. Have you tried this in court? No, but there's a lot of people. I don't have to. I mean, they don't ever bother me ever. But there are people now sending me all kinds of evidence just so you know, I could I could prove it. And I can show the letters I get from people that say, oh, my God. I mean, I, I in fact, the last call I did, I actually read one of the <clears> letters <throat> on the call yesterday morning where a guy said, yeah, I did all that Patriot shit, Kurt. Guess what? The moment I stopped doing it, the moment I actually asked the judge, hey, listen, the cut. The, the, the birth certificate itself is predicated upon the act of mayhem, the cutting of the umbilical, and the larceny, the taking of the property and placing it on deposit. And, and he asked the judge, are you going to be liable for this? And the judge, that was it. The case disappeared. So I'm wow. telling you that when you know the truth, the truth does actually make you free. All this other manipulation and playing the game and, and trying to get this, 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 this stuff, it doesn't make any sense when you know the truth. I don't even bother with it. I um well uh, again you're blowing me away because I cause <laughs> I get what why you're saying this but I I get it like a couple steps removed from where you're taking me so like if I go to court I understand they want my consent to move forward you're showing me philosophically how they can't how I don't have to give my consent and the burden of proof is on them because they're the ones making the claim they're the ones act but nobody sees it that way. Nobody sees I that they're know. making the yeah, you see it now. But I mean, again, if if again, if I presume you have a birthday, the other thing that happens is if they force me to accept their position, I mean, so number one, they have the burden of proof. But if they force me into it, if they even if they break my will and force me to sign something, um, it didn't change my mind. And and now the fact that I they have a signature, they go, oh, now we got we got evidence of his his uh, agreement. No, that's called undue influence. Right. So any way you look at this stuff, you can you can shred every case. There is no joinder. It's not even a possibility if you know the truth. But nobody cares about that because all the patriot groups out there, they're trying to beat something. They're trying to get something for nothing. They're trying to access this 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 account. There is no account. 
There is no separate account. When, when you know the truth, there is no separate account. The separate account only exists in, as a fiction and only because of the duality of the cut. When you go all the way back, this is back to the future stuff. If you go all the way back to the beginning and, you're, and you recognize all present and accounted for from fertilization to last breath, you've included the missing nine months in the womb. So it's an unbroken timeline, which is life. And of course, the Sedicae by 1666 says when a man proves life, he's revested with, well, there it is. The moment you prove or evidence life, all of the fictions disappear. There is, and by the way, all jurisdictions are fictitious. Every jurisdiction is a fictional jurisdiction. So imagine in nature, you all of a sudden now start to align yourself with nature and every fictitious jurisdiction uh, disappears. You don't even have to claim anything. You just stick with the light of truth and all of their shit disappears. There's a court case, Cruden versus Neal. Best court case ever, 1796. And, and there's a line right out of there. And, and you can read the whole court case. It's an amazing case. But it comes down to one thing. It said, there, and he's talking about nature, in nature, there, nature. Every man is independent of all laws except those prescribed by nature. And what's interesting about that is everybody goes, yeah, so what, Kurt? Well, wait a minute here. Fertilization is the beginning of life. The birth certificated character is the beginning of a false narrative, a fictitious narrative. So when you realign yourself with life, you line yourself up with Cruden versus Neal. There, every man is independent of all laws except those prescribed by nature. Fertilization is the beginning of life. That's nature. Birth certificate is not. It's the opposite. It's contrary to nature. So what they're doing at the federal level and at the lower court level, because there's no genuine issue, is that they're trying to correct your omission. Your omission is the first nine months in the womb. They're just the Department of Corrections is just trying to correct you. For making that that claim, that erroneous claim, that mistake. That mistake is claiming a birthday. Well, what about the first nine months of life? Oh, we'll fix that. We'll 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 fix that with this the statute that we created, the birthday statute. So they add the statute. They're pretending to do you a service by putting you back with God. It's called conversion, but we won't go into that. But then they're saying they're making you whole for that moment until you go out and break it again by claiming a birthday again or doing whatever. The point is, is that when you know the truth, from fertilization to last breath, there's nothing missing. And if there's nothing missing, that's life. And even biblically, even biblically, it says the spiritual man shall be judged by no man, 1 Corinthians 2.15. And what's weird about that is it says the spiritual man shall be judged by no man. Well, nobody even knows what spiritual means. To breathe is to be inspired or to be spiritual. All you have to be doing to be considered spiritual is breathing. That's spirituality. Breathing is the spirit. You're, you're inspired. You're filled with the spirit when you're breathing. Well, does a birth certificated fictitious character breathe? No, of course no. not. No, hell no. It's, it's actually devoid of spirit, which is also a spiritual bankruptcy. See, nobody even knows what the bankruptcy is. It's a spiritual bankruptcy. It's you're devoid of breath. The birth certificated person is devoid of breath. He's spiritually bankrupt. So they have a decedent estate that they have to manage or administrate because there's no living man. This shit is easy. <laughs> I can I can see now that it's taken me. I got into the law study group in Chico in 2005. So what are we? Uh, 29 years later, something like that. Yeah, it's taken me this long just to be able to follow along with you in this interview. So, um, <laughs> and the reality, I'm, I'm always amazed how reality is really so much more simple on not just law, but in, in medicine, for example, or in history, everything is really so much more simple than, than what the powers that be have given to us. And um, what I find really fascinating, Curtis, is that the guys that were teaching me, some really great guys uh, have done some legendary things, um, we can talk about that more some other time, but they were they were saying when you go into court, you're not the fictitious name. You're the flesh and blood individual. So they were kind of on the same tack as what you're saying, but they did not have that philosophical um, monologue behind it, that philosophical explanation backing that up. And so a lot of the a lot of the people that I studied with actually got in trouble because uh, they had to do a psych evaluation 
<clears throat> or they just they call, call, do what I call steamrolling you in court when they just they don't want to hear your BS. Nobody in the courtroom understands what you're saying. So they just enter a plea for you or dismiss your paperwork without grounds by which to do that, that kind of a thing. And um, I, I mean, I would just love to see um, the look on some of the local judges faces here. I'm in Butte County, California. It's about two hours north of Sacramento and the north end of the Central Central Valley. And uh, it's really super corrupt here. I know it's corrupt everywhere, but but um, these guys, once they knew we were in the law study group and we come and we were trying to fight the tickets um, in a number of different ways, they would they would just challenge us to go to the next level because they didn't want to hear it. They, we might have killer paperwork, whatever. But what you're doing, it's 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 brilliant. And I don't think I've understated that or overstated that. You there, are, there, there's a law maxim: fictio sedet veritati. Fiction yields to truth. The moment the truth is known, all of the fictitious goes goes bye bye. So again, but but how do you prove if you keep claiming the birth certificated narrative? You can't get back to the beginning. You can't get back to biology, which or the, your your biological origin. In fact, look at how easy this is. I had a friend of mine. I have to slow down myself because I mean I can, so I can feel your energy, brother. Oh my God! So I had a buddy of mine call me a couple weeks ago. It's been three or four weeks by now, and he was calling from Nebraska, and uh, he said, hey, "Kurt, I sent a letter to the Secretary of State, and they sent it back to me." I said, "Really?" And it, and all the note was, it said, "Listen, we can't accept this letter. We can't do anything with it because there's no signature." And I said, "What are you talking about?" And he goes, "Well, you know, I, I just put a thumbprint on it." Now, again, I don't sign anything, and I don't even put a name on anything anymore. I put the author backslash pacifist. That's 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 what they get at the end of my letters. And then I put a thumbprint over the top of that, and I'll explain that in a second. Okay. Um, and he, sa and he says, well, they, they sent it back because they said there was no signature. I said, really? I said, you know, are you home? And he goes, yeah. I said, get to your computer. He goes to the computer. I said, go to Webster's, Webster's Online Dictionary. He goes to Webster's. He said, look up signature. And sure enough, he goes to say, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to do it while I'm talking to you. I'm, so I'm going to go to Signature at Webster's. Um, you can hear me clicking away? <laughs> no, actually. Signature. But, okay, but, so I'm going to Signature at Webster's. I just want to read it. Okay. And and so so the state sends back his letter and says, we, we got this letter, but we can't do anything with it because there was no signature. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I just thumbprinted it like you do. And I said, okay, so let's go to Signature. And so we're looking through signature and, and, and all of a sudden he, he gets down to number seven and he goes, Oh my God. I said, what? He goes, it says fingerprint. So I said, are you telling me that a fingerprint is a, is a signature? I said, I said, Kevin, it's a biometric signature. In fact, it's the only way you can go all the way back to your godly origin because tell me the moment dad's sperm fertilizes mom's ovum, what was your name, Kevin? And he goes, I didn't have one. I said, so you're telling me there was no name at creation. Nope. I said, but what did exist at creation? He goes, my DNA, my biology. I said, right. Isn't your thumbprint evidence of that DNA? And he goes, yep. I said, so you realize that by putting your thumbprint on there, you just got all the nat natural equity? If you sign it with a name, the name begins at the birthday. The name begins nine months too late. So any name that you sign doesn't include the equity of nature the first nine months in the womb the only way you can go all the way back to the beginning is biologically or genetically and that's a thumbprint so i said it does have a it does have a signature doesn't it he goes yeah it has a fingerprint i said okay so if it were me i said i would actually print off webster's dictionary and i would highlight number seven where it says fingerprint and send it back i wouldn't even argue with him i'd just show him that a fingerprint is actually a signature by the way, it's a biological, biometric signature. It's the only one that gets you back to God. You, you know, can't sign a name and get back to God. Um, this is blowing me away. So so I've studied occult magic for years and years, had some one-on-one -on -one teachers. And in in some of the magical scripts, they have this in the Druid tradition, especially they have sigils, S-I-G-I-L. And it's a one-time kind of a, a design that's supposed to mean something in a certain moment in time. And then you kind of move on kind of thing. So the word signature has sig for sigil and then nature <laughs> so it's, it's exactly your sig sigil that god gave you when you were born 
Your thumb and it's all—it's unique, and it's sense. only yours. It's unique. It's only yours. So that means it cannot be part of the public. And That's what's right. really fun about this is that it actually goes all the way back to the beginning. No name goes back to the beginning. So if you sign a name, the best you can do is the record, and the record is a public record. So the best you can do by signing any name is the public record, which puts you into the public or makes you of the public. Whereas the genetics, which is why they capture all that shit, why they use biometrics, they, they're actually grabbing your equity. In fact, I'll do this. I'm going to go to equity. We got I'm going to go to the word. Just so you know. I'm going to go to the word equity right now okay. um, at, at Webster's because I got it open. Let me just see what it says here. Look at that. Um, equity. Yeah. Number one, at, at Webster's online, it says justice according to natural law. Or right. Equity is justice according to natural law. That's equity. Nobody even knows how to get to equity. You can't get to equity unless you go back to nature. Right. <laughs> I've tried that and they just ignore it. So well, I'm sure you'd, be, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Yeah, there's something else going on. Something right. you missed. Okay. Um, man, I had goosebumps when I just watched <laughs> the sig nature, sigil na of nature thing. It's beautiful, man, um, what you said. Uh, just you're, you're blow it's taken me 29 years just to be able to follow along with you even though i don't know what you know i can follow along and i so i feel like i understand what you're saying and it is really it's really super simple so but last thing we got three minutes is there a document that you'd use say i've got a bunch of traffic tickets in the past right i've won some i've lost some they've impounded a couple cars um, is there a document i use or do i have to make just like a special appearance and come in and put the judge on the spot about making the claim. And now you have to prove it. And if they can't prove it and I do that on the record, then I can get all my stuff back. Is there something you could that you do normally or tell people to do for that? I don't tell anybody anything, but what I do is I, I educate them to the point where they, they, they can start to act on their own. But I'm going to tell you right now, the last few months I've been working specifically on a singular letter that does everything. If, as long as you know this, once you, once you understand the biology and, and you know reality, this letter undoes everything. It, 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 it removes all plausible about deniability. These guys can't move. They can't do anything. Everything will be dismissed. I guarantee. But I only let my P the PMA members have it because okay. I get to speak. I only get to speak freely amongst the, the private member association people. Um, I'm doing it pretty much here, but, but nobody really knows what I'm saying. Um, but my, the point is, is I do have a letter. It's front back. It's the, the greatest letter I've ever seen in my life. By the way, I've written all the greatest letters prior to that, too. If you if you know any of my work, if you saw the first book, Right of Way, and you saw the letters that were in that book, understand that everybody that ever received a letter from me, they quit. And I'm talking about highest office in Illinois, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Imagine that. It's 11 days after receiving my letter, the Secretary of Homeland Security quit. These people don't last very long when they receive a letter from me. So, um, mm. but it's the truth. See, that's the beauty is the truth doesn't have enemies. So how can you be afraid when all you're doing is shining the light of truth? There's no enemy. There's right. no enemy to truth. It's non-combative, so, right? Non-combative. It's, okay. it's a pacifist. It's the Pacific position. Okay, we're going to talk about that, the Pacific tra transcription. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit more about right away. I want to talk about uh, expert uh, expert witness, and um, and uh, we're going to do that in the next segment. You're going to join me for another segment? Oh, absolutely. We could talk about, uh, you know, our friend Jordan, too. Okay, great. Um, time went by. Did we just – that was 40 minutes? I can't even believe it. That was absolutely incredible. I can't either, man. I can't uh, even. That was, that was half a cup of coffee. That was, right? And I can yeah. imagine you on three cups of coffee. <laughs> so thank you for your time. We'll see you, everyone, in the next segment for Episode 70. Thank you, Curtis. Welcome.